So while we're here, isn't it, for God's Word, it's going to be uh, it's going to be good when we get together and we read what God's Word together. I always say this, and I mean it. I mean it every time. I'm going to do it again tonight. I really like to take a Bible school type of approach where we come, and you know what we've come to do? We've come to learn. We've come to hear from the Lord tonight. The best way we do that is I'm going to get behind here. I'm going to give you a scripture. You're going to have your Bible. You're going to open it up, or you're going to have notes. We're going to take notes, and we're going to hear from the Lord tonight. If you came expecting to hear, hopefully you came expecting to write something down. If not, whatever you hear, you ain't going to take very far with you. And so uh, I want to encourage you. I know you've got a phone in your pocket. If you don't have a notebook, you've got a notes application on your phone. It's just built in right there. Let's expect to hear from the Lord tonight and get it out. Sound good? Let me, let me go ahead and butter you up with a joke or two. I know, uh, I, I know you're kind of, Pastor Nate's getting you used to this, and so if you don't get it, you kind of start getting the twitches a little bit. But um, I read one where uh, this guy, this dad was, was needing to have the talk with his son. He said, son, come on, we, we need to have a talk. Uh, there's, there's coming a time where you're going to start having these feelings and getting these urges, and, you know, your heart's going to beat really fast and your hands are going to get sweaty and your mind's going to be preoccupied. You won't be able to think of anything else. But don't worry. This is what golf does to you. Okay? I read that and that was for me. And it's true. So, just so you all know. There, there was another one where this teacher was outside at recess with, uh, with the kids. They were playing and uh, one, of the, one of the kids was making ugly faces at some of the kids. And... She went over and she said, Bobby, uh, when I was young, I was told that if you make those ugly faces for too long, your face will freeze like that. And, and he said, well, Miss Smith, you can't say they didn't warn you. you know? <laughs> That's tough. Bobby Sharp, you got to watch out for Bobbies out there. They'll, they'll get you. They'll get you. Hey, how many of you were here for Sunday uh, for the first message in Arrival of the King series? Man, it was so good. Isn't it refreshing to hear about heaven? I'm going to move this up. I loved it because it, it's so true what Pastor Nate's talking about, how uh, sadly, as believers, remember, we're believers because we believe in the finished work of Jesus. And guess what comes with being a believer? Salvation, being saved eternally. Heaven is your home. Heaven is my home. And it's amazing how we can continue to live this life without thinking about heaven. I can think more about my upcoming vacation or my next big thing here, and I'll give that far more thought than I do to where I'm going to be spending eternity. That's far better. I mean, like he was talking about, sometimes we think of it like some, it's some consolation prize, and we're more focused on God's blessings and promises here and now than what's there. Man. We've got a bright future, a good future, a good future, amen? I want to recap a few things that uh, we talked about on Sunday that he mentioned that they were just so good. One of them was this, the trials that I'm going through are temporary, but so is breakthrough. Boy, a lot of times we don't think about that. We think of breakthrough as the thing. We think of breakthrough as the end. Guess what's going to happen when you break through? Another trial is going to come up, probably sooner rather than later. So when our focus is on the breakthrough, guess what? Another trial is, are, is already on its way. It's already on its way. It's temporary. And we, Pastor Evan opened last night in prayer with this same scripture that we've, that we've read a lot around here lately in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 17, if you can put that up there. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 through 18, it says, For our present troubles are small and they won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. And so even when breakthrough comes, so this is cool. What I see now, I'm not looking at the troubles that I see now. I know they're temporary. But guess what I know now too? Breakthrough's temporary as well. So even when breakthrough comes, it should not change my gaze. My gaze should continue to be fixed on what I cannot see. Just because God's promise manifests in my life, it doesn't mean that everything's all hunky-dory and things are what they should be. Because guess what? 
There's going to be some other area of my life that need God's attention, and so my eyes should continue to stay fixed on what I cannot see. His word, right? His word. Another thing I loved uh, was my hope for tomorrow gives me strength for today. Oh, this is so good. My hope for the future is what will give me strength in a present trouble right now. Man, our hope is so important. And I love, he was saying, your hope has to be tied to you. He was giving the example of the anchor and everything. Your hope has to be tied to you. If the anchor ain't connected to the boat, that anchor ain't doing you any good. You're not tied to anything. You're just, you're just out there all on your own. And so it's really cool to have hope for a certain situation that you may be facing right now. But guess what? You're going to need hope for another situation that you're going to be facing and then another one. So I'd rather just consolidate my hope into one source instead of just hope for this, hope for that, hope for that. Man, it tells us in, in Hebrews chapter 6, 19, you can throw it up. This hope, the hope that we're talking about, is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. Uh, so real Bible hope we see is anchored to our souls. It's not attached to certain situations. It's anchored to our souls. I love this one too. My highs never hit like I think they would because they can't get to what I'm really after. Man, we're on, this, we're on this emotional roller coaster in life, and the highs that you hit in life, man, they never really hit it like you think it was going to. Did you ever, have you ever noticed, like, the anticipation of something in your life that you're looking forward to seems to be greater than it? Right? I mean, it, it's, like this, it's like this for a lot of things. I used vacation earlier. I mean, that's just one of the main things. Uh, if I'm going on vacation or something, the lead up to that or where I'm going, if I'm looking forward to it and I've been wanting to do it for a long time, that typically can be more satisfying than the actual vacation itself because I've built it up so much in my mind as to what it's going to be, as to what it's going to do for me, right? And so there, there's an anticipation there and a buildup. But this feeling... That feeling right there, the, the highs, the lows, this is not how God intended us to live life. Up here, all right, back down here, up and back and down and up and down and up. And, that is not God's best for our life. It's not his best. And there is a way that we can live with that joyful anticipation when we realize that heaven is our home. Like when we have a daily recognition that heaven is my home, guess what? You, it's like it's like we're going on vacation guys here soon we're going on a long long vacation to the best place you could possibly imagine and there will be no coming back from it it's an eternal vacation what what are, what are we so down about right now I'm telling you, the week of your vacation, let's just say, let me set the scene for you. You're going on a two-week vacation, all expense, paid trip to Hawaii. Just whatever you, whatever you like to do. Hawaii's got it there. You like it. Whatever. If that's not your thing, think of something else. All right? Guess what? You're leaving in two days. Right now, you could care less what I'm saying up here because you're thinking about Hawaii, right? And this is how heaven should be for us. It should mean very little, the, some of the, the trivial things that we put our mind on so much here because of what we've got right ahead of us. It's just right ahead of us. And so I want to talk to you tonight about this super popular word in the Bible called contentment. Oh, you love it, don't you? You love even hearing that word contentment. And uh, this is one of those things where, you know, we have to, we have to be very intentional with how we live every day, and this living with contentment requires intentionality and it requires effort. It might require a little more effort than some of us are willing to put in to live a content life. And it's kind of a word that you wouldn't put together with intentionality and effort, like contentment you just think may be settling, but that's not true, and we're going to see that in the Word tonight. Are you ready? All right, let's pray. We're going to need the Lord's help tonight. Father, we come to you right now, and we just want to say thank you that you've brought us here to this place. We thank you for your word that it has all the life and all the power that we'll ever need for this life and the next. Uh, and so we thank you that that very word, your very word, uh, is active, is present tonight. Holy Spirit, you're the teacher. We invite you to teach each and every one of us 
wherever we're at, whatever level we're on, teach us right where we're at uh, so that we can get your word in us and live a victorious life here and now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, and talking about contentment, it reminded me of a story. I actually talked to the young adults about this uh, on Friday. But it reminds me of a story in, in my life. If you know me or you've been around a little bit, you may know that my wife and I, we adopted our two girls. Uh, and so we're going, my wife and I are going on 20 years next year. We actually are going to Hawaii. So that, <laughs> I think, we haven't planned it at all. But I, it's, it's, supposed to, it's supposed to happen. So, you know, uh, I'm not really looking forward to it. I mean, there's, there's nothing planned yet. But anyway... Uh, 20 years, and so um, right after we got married, we were like, hey, you know what? Let's have kids. We're, we're young. We're smart. This is a good idea. This is great. This is smart. 19 years old, we're ready. Let's do it. <laughs> so that was cool. Well, um, we, we, had, we had trouble having kids, and um, we ended up adopting our girls, I don't know, when we were, I don't know, six, seven years down the road. But during this time, it was during this, this time period here, where there was a lot of biblical truth that we were able to learn and we needed to learn. Um, and some of those things that came out were, uh, you know, we found out that we were living a life wanting what we didn't have. Come on, I need you all to listen now because there's going to be some things, there's some things in your life right now that you're wanting right now that you don't have. Right? Uh, th this led us to comparing our lives to other people's lives our friends, our people our age, right? You know what comparison leads to eventually? It leads to envy. Oh, envy is not a good thing. We're, we're going to read about that in a second. It leads to bitterness. Man, bitterness, that's not a good place to be at. So we, we were living at, at different times. We were living not content with where we were at and what our lives looked like. Not content at all. And we got to the point, however long it took, I guess when we were 26 or so, 25, 26, and I, I remember this. You know, there are some things where um, you'll remember just marked moments in your life or very important words that happened to that be turning points, and this was one of those, and it was very clear from the Lord. I don't know if it came from, I can't remember if it came from uh, someone he spoke through or if it was just to my spirit or what, but he, he said this. He said, would you still love me and serve me if I never ended up, if you never ended up having kids? If this never happened for you, would you still love me? Would you still serve me? Is what I've done for you up to this point good enough for that? And that seems maybe like, a, like okay, well, that, you kind of, I mean, you're taking it a little far there. But this is, this is where it was. And you've got to be honest with yourself when you're answering questions that God's asking you. Because he knows if you're lying. I mean, what are we doing, right? You've got to be honest. But, but just hearing that alone, hearing that alone from the Father was enough for me to say, oh my gosh, yes. Yes, of course. If this never happens, if something that I want so bad doesn't ever happen, I will still love you and I will still serve you because what you did for me in personally sending Jesus just for me, just for me, so that I could be with you forever is more than enough. You would never have to do one other thing for me to love you and for me to serve you. And at that moment, going, going forward, there was something that, that broke on our lives where things kind of sped up to where they did and the rest is history. We adopted two girls from the state of Arkansas that sometimes I wonder if they take back. <laughs> it's terrible. That's a joke. It's pretty cruel that you would laugh at that, honestly. No. Um, but on, no, honestly, like, see, Courtney, we were in some different places here. Uh, I felt like during a lot of that time, I was much stronger than her and, and helping carry her through some of that time. And there towards the end, I was the one who wasn't really hearing from the Lord until something like this happened, right? And you get that question, and you have to answer that. And I love how God is always at work behind the scenes. God never quits on us. He never gives up on us. 
And this is why, you know, you know where we were at during this time in our life? We were here in church, planted in church, serving, attending, going to things, being involved. And if it weren't being connected for the, the local church, I'm telling you, there are things in your life that just won't happen unless you're connected to where God's called you to be. It just won't. This is what I shared with these young people the other night. I love, you know what? Uh, we were super, we've been super busy, and I'm like, oh, man, we've got an event coming up. We're going to do this. I love sometimes when you're super busy and you have a church event on your calendar that, that you have to make a decision whether you're going to go to or not. It would be better if you committed to something like that and you kept your commitment to something like that because those are the things, these are the guardrails that God has set up in our lives to help keep us on the path that he wants us to. There are answers in the place God, ha God has called you to. And they are set like guardrails so that if I don't miss, if I don't miss this event, guess what? I'm going to stay here on this path instead of I'm going to miss one, I'll miss another. And here I'm veering off down a way God never intended for me to go. So it's not just another event that you're going to. It's another step towards the destiny that God has for you. So don't take a step off just because it's inconvenient to you because you've overstuffed your schedule with things that you think matter more. I mean, we're talking, about, we're talking about your destiny here. We're talking about your kids, your family's destinies. What's more important, right? And so there, there are certain things uh, that, that, we were, that we were dealing with here. But guess what? It's something that I learned. I, I was able to learn how to be content with where we were at. Learn. I learned how to be content right where we were at in the state of life that we were in right then, and that's when some things started to happen. And so we're going to learn this from the Apostle Paul. He talks about this secret of contentment. But before that, I want to hit a few scriptures here on some of the things I just talked about. Comparison, envy, greed. A lot of these things that I think we probably hear about, we're very well aware of. I mean, in the day and age in which we live, we know social media has presented this to us where um, young people and people in general are now dealing with something on a level that we weren't dealing with 15, 20 years ago. Because it's in your face, it's all the time, it's constant, and it seems to that everyone has it. Everybody. Everybody has it now, right? And so comparison is a real thing. Uh, let's look at uh, Luke, Luke chapter 12, verse 15. We're just going to kind of run through some scriptures here on these things to set the stage, okay? All right, Luke 12, 15, this is Jesus talking. He says, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Oh, man, this should take some pressure off of us right here. Isn't it nice to know that life, your life is not measured by how much you own? It is not measured that way. And so uh, this qualifies each and every one of us that we can be content right where we're at, right now, tonight, on a Wednesday night, whatever state we're in, we can be content. Right now. Right now. Um, you know what's funny, too, is like w when, you, when you see what someone else has or you see something that you want and maybe you end up getting that thing, does it actually make you content? Do the things, the stuff, do, do these things actually make you content or do they just make you more insatiable? Next, what's next? Next thing. What's, what's the next thing? I got this. I got that new driver. When's, where's the next one? I need the, I, need the new, I need the newest one. They make a new one every year for a reason. So we'll, because they know we're going to buy it, right? Cause, because they know. And I, I don't know. I switched my notes around just right before. I don't know that I want to say that yet, but I, I want to say this, and I may say it again later. Because I know this is a message uh, that, we, that we may hear about, know about, we know, that, we know the danger of, of comparison. We know the danger of comparing our lives with others, the danger of envy. Or maybe we don't. But if we do, and I like to think that, you know, I, 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 do, I, do, I know that. I know that there's danger in doing that, and I need to be thankful for where I'm at and for what I have. But I want to read what I wrote down here because I don't, it might have been yesterday or two days ago. But I said, why is it that we all say amen to this? We nod our head. We even sit quietly and agree with it because deep down we know it's true. And yet, and yet we often entertain the idea that something more will move our contentment needle from here to there. 
I mean, we're all sitting here, and we've all done this. I've, I've done this myself. Yeah, I know that's true. Amen. 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 And yet, I'm sitting there thinking, if I just had this, if I had a little more where the pressure is off a little bit, if I just had this one thing, we are actually still convinced that getting that one thing or getting whatever it is will move our contentment needle from here to there like it's going to do the trick. Guys, we have to wake up to this that it will not. It won't. It won't. We have to answer that question right here and now. Am I content where I'm at, where God has me right now, right now? We have to answer that question. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians um, chapter 10, verse 12. It says, We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. And so talking about comparison, they're comparing themselves with others. They're comparing themselves with themselves. I'm comparing myself to a former version of myself. Well, that's not wise. We use this scripture when we're talking about people just make the standard whatever they want to make it. Oh, they're doing this. That's the standard now. No, the standard is the word of God, and it's never changed, and it never will change. It is the one thing that is eternal. This and, and souls are the one thing that's eternal. The standard is this, and it will not change. It won't change. And so one of the things that um, has come up, Brother Keith Morris said this, in so many messages for years, and I've heard it a lot, a lot lately, one of the best things that we can do is to not talk about what we don't have, what we can't do, and what we're not. This, is one of, this would set you free if you did this. I'm not going to talk about what I'm not. I'm not going to talk about what I don't have. I'm not going to talk about what I can't do. Whenever we're talking about those things, what happens is it just it trends darker and darker and darker when all we see is what I can't do, who I'm not, and what I don't have. We know this. We know this. It just trends that way. So that's not what we're going to focus on. Let's go to James chapter 3. I want to just hit a few more scriptures here as we're talking about comparison um, greed and envy. James 3, 14 through 16, it says, But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. And that's kind of weird that he says, do not boast. I'm not sure why someone would be boasting about that. But he does say this, don't deny the truth. And these are just good questions that we can ask ourselves sitting here. Am I harboring bitter envy in my heart or selfish ambition? It, is that anywhere in, in me? Does it have any part in me at all? Such wisdom, you can see Paul's nice sarcasm here, such wisdom, he says, does not come down from heaven, but, is earth, but it is earthly, it's unspiritual, and it's demonic. So comparison is something that can very easily lead to envy. And envy isn't something that's just unhealthy for you on a personal level. Here's what it says. It is unspiritual and it is demonic here's what it says for where you have envy and selfish ambition there you find disorder and every evil practice boy this is not a good place to be in right now um, when I allow um, something that I see that someone else has and I begin to compare myself to that and I become and, and I just let uh, this seed gets planted and I just kind of let it grow a little bit by not doing something about it then by not talking by not plucking it up by not using my words to pluck it up i'm letting the seed grow that could grow into envy and there you can find disorder and every evil practice that is not something that i want in my life at all and sometimes we wonder why some things are happening in our life and there's there's things going on and we, we, we might be letting envy just run amok in our hearts. Envy. Wanting what we don't have. Wanting what someone else has. That's not okay. Um, let's look at Ecclesiastes 6.9. Ecclesiastes 6.9. It says, enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. Just dreaming about nice things is meaningless like chasing the wind. Do you know that you could be... By the way, I, I read all of Ecclesiastes today, 
And, I mean, if you're ever just wanting to get existential, just, just go read Ecclesiastes. And if you don't know what existential is, look it up. I did earlier, and I forgot what it meant, but it applies here. But it's widely believed that King Solomon was the author of Ecclesiastes, and he calls himself the teacher here. And if you've read it before, like the theme is, he's, he's he, you know, He's widely, he's not widely believed. The Bible says he's the wisest man that, that ever lived outside of Jesus. He's it. The wisest and richest. And you know what sums up Ecclesiastes and Solomon's view? It's all meaningless. It's all meaningless. And I'm like, I'm like why, did, why did God put this in here? Right? But there's a reason for it. And I was thinking about it and I was, because I read all of Philippians too. The, you know, the, the book that obviously uh, Paul wrote to the church at Philippi there. And if you know in Philippians, he wrote that when he was imprisoned in Rome, right? Paul, Paul was in prison or he was, he was imprisoned when he wrote this one. Uh, this was one that he wrote uh, later towards the end of his life, the book of Philippians. But I was juxtaposing those two books and I, it, it seemed very clear that King Solomon lived in a world before Jesus had come and had completed this amazing work, and Paul lived in a world after Jesus did this amazing work because Paul's life was very much filled with purpose, and he talks about this, and it was so it was just very, it was very funny contrasting those two books uh, today, so that's just a little homework for you if you want to go do that, but there's a lot of truth here in Ecclesiastes, and this is what he ends up saying to a lot of it. It's like chasing the wind. But at the end of Ecclesiastes, he, you know what he said? I had that somewhere down here. He said, um, uh, let's see. His summary when looking back on life was that it was all meaningless and chasing the wind. Although he concluded the book by saying and summed up that we should fear God and obey his commands. He knew something was there. Something was there in that. Um, all right, where were we? What book were we in here? A little louder and more in unison, please. Thank you. <laughs> Ecclesiastes. Oh, that makes sense. That's what I'm talking about. All right. All right. I get it. Um, so he says, enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. Man, what a novel concept that is. Enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. How, how much time do you think we spend enjoying what we have opposed to desiring what we don't have? Think about it. The things that you're using, let's just talk about maybe our vehicle, for instance. And I, this has been something I've battled with. How much time have I been enjoying my vehicles lately? Uh, just hit a deer the other day with one. Cool damage, getting all that replaced. How many times when, you, when your car's been in the shop a couple times? I'm not really enjoying what I have right now. Haven't enjoyed it so much. You know what I've been doing? I've been desiring a new vehicle. Because a new vehicle would never have problems like that. It would never hit a deer. It's got all the things that'll blink and it'll steer away from it on its own. Come on, is this real? Do we spend most of our time desiring what we don't have instead of enjoying what we do have? And the truth of the matter is, is that if I spend more time enjoying what I do have and opening up my mouth on a daily basis and thanking God for what I do have, can, can you, I can tell you how content you would be with life and what you're doing. What you're doing is you're setting yourself up for the better because you're thankful for what you have right now. Instead of undermining your faith for better by always complaining about what you have. Amen. Amen. All right, let's go to Psalms 137, 1 through 5. Psalms 137, 1 through 5, it says, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in, in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And I'm trying to even remember how this got put in here, but it is so good. I love this. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Um, you know, I, you can take this scripture, I guess, a few different ways, but 
the way that, that I, I interpret it and we've been taught is that the Lord will put the desires that he wants for you in your heart, and that's what you'll truly want. Like, he will give you the desires of your heart. He doesn't just give you whatever you desire, whatever. God's not just like this vending machine where, like, I desire this, I want that. No, he'll give you the desires of your heart. And what we know in uh, Philippians 2, uh, Paul says, For it's God working in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So he's going to give you the desires of your heart, and then he's going to be working in you to give you the ability to do his will. Man, this is good. God is good. God's good. He's got it all worked out. He's got it worked out. All for us. And so, I, I just wanted to share a few things there on comparison and how that leads to envy and how we need to watch this in our life, be very watchful of it, and let's ask ourselves these questions. This is one of the things you need to write down in your notes. Is this anywhere in my life? Ask the Lord. He'll show you. Is this evident anywhere in my life? Because if it is, you need to deal with it very strongly and get it out of there because we do not want all the, these evil things to be showing up in our life just because we haven't dealt with envy that's popped up. Amen? Amen. All right, I want to go to Philippians 4, and we're going to talk about how uh, this secret that Paul learned, Philippians 4, chapter, or chapter 4, verses 10 through 14. It says, How I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned. Someone say, I have learned. I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. So, this tells me that contentment isn't a disposition that you're born with. It's something that you have to learn and put into practice. Paul says, I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. Baby, you know that babies aren't born content? They're not born that way. They're born crying. They're born ready to be pacified. They must grow and be trained and be taught not to be selfish. Right? I love last week, Aaron, Aaron was talking about this. She had that quote from E.W. Kenyon uh, that says, Satan disguises submission to himself under the ruse of personal autonomy. Satan disguises submission to himself under the ruse of personal autonomy. He's not trying to be my master. He, he just wants self-interest to reign in my life. He, the, Satan just wants self-interest to reign in my life. And she alluded to this, and that's what Satanism is. It is the worship of self. It's the worship of self. And so when we're naturally, like, we're selfish, and we have to be trained. We have to learn God's ways and implement his ways into our life. Amen. If self-interest is reigning in my life, then my lifestyle will just perfectly mirror whatever highs or lows I'm experiencing at that time. True or not, that's true. And I won't be mirroring the one who I'm to be representing. We are representatives. We're representatives of Christ. I'm to represent what he looks like. And I will not be doing that if self-interest is reigning in my life. So if Paul learned this secret, then he must have went to, he must have been schooled. He must have been schooled with the opportunity to learn this, right? Uh, let's look at, uh, some, some of the school he went to here in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty four. Paul said, Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. I forgot about that. That's a lot. I mean, didn't they give them 39 lashes because 40 was basically the point where, like, hey, they're going to die. So let's go with five times of 39 lashes for Paul. All right, what's next? Three times he was beaten with rods. Once he was stoned, three times shipwrecked. Yikes. Here's the worst one to me out of all this. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea, I'm out. Out on that one. Give me the rods. Give me, give me the lashes, and we'll see if I make it. I'm not taking my chances adrift out at sea. Just floating out there, sharks and all kinds of stuff. How many of you are with me? Okay, good. Man. I mean, no, no, yeah, none of it sounds good, but I mean, if we had to choose, if it was some kind of sick game, right? 
He said, I've traveled on many long journeys. I've faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities and the deserts and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. Boy, that one's tough there too. I have worked hard and long, and during many sleepless nights, I have been hungry and thirsty and have gone often, have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. And so we, Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians here. He wrote this letter to the church at Corinth five or six years before he wrote Philippians. So even when he wrote this letter, all this had happened at the time he wrote this letter. So five or six years later, he, he's a little older. He's an old man at this point. Paul's been, he's learned some things. He says, I've learned some things. And what was the secret? Let's go back up to uh, Philippians 4, 10 through 14. Let's pick up in verse 12. He says, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. He says, for I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And th this, uh, this scripture right here is a great secret for us. And somehow it's been boiled down to like uh, just this, this scripture that Christian athletes like to use. Oh, I can do all things through Christ. I mean, I, I, I used it all through high school. I mean, of course. Are we good? Is this, is this on still? Huh? Oh, okay, my fault. Um, how many of you have used this before? Like that. I can do all things through Christ who drinks. Okay, just seven of you. Well, cool. Maybe this is new to you. That's great. You're going to learn a really cool secret tonight. Listen, participation in church is good. I love what Chip Brim does. Somebody give me a little bit of this. Yeah. Oh, good. Everything, your head works. That's awesome. Good to know. Nod, act alive. I love it. Participate. Participate. But this isn't something that we just have splattered on the wall in uh, weight rooms. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is a secret that Paul learned. And the cool part about this verse is that it also applied to when Paul... See, sometimes we're thinking, oh man, all those things that Paul went through, this was his secret. He knew that he could make it. He knew, you know that why Paul could make it? He had a word from God. He had a word from God, and he can do all things through Christ. His trust, was in, his trust was in Jesus, and he knew that he could do and overcome in any situation. And one of the coolest things I picked up on this verse, I want to go back up here and read it in Philippians. He says, I know how to live on almost nothing. Check this out. He also knows how to live with everything. He's learned the secret of living in every situation. Say every situation. Because sometimes we don't identify as much with living on nothing or little. We might be in a pretty decent spot. Guess what? It applies. It applies here. He says whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or with little. It also applied to Paul when he was living prosperous with a full belly he knew he knew the secret to living didn't change he lived that way because he was relying on christ's strength and not his own this is how he was able to stay off the emotional roller coaster that most people are living on day to day this is how this secret right here it was the same for any and all circumstances and here is the key part he employed it he employed this secret. He did. He employed this secret. He didn't just know about it. He didn't just think that's a cool verse that I have, that I have a sticker of somewhere. He lived this. He lived it. And you know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, the, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. A lot of times when you hear these verses or you've heard them over the course of your life, you, you may, they may have been watered down in your, in your own mind about what they truly are. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Can't should not be something that's in your vocabulary as a believer. This should be something that we model in our homes. Our kids should, should not say, I can't do this. I can't learn this. I, I say, no, you can learn it. In fact, you're a great learner. You understand things quickly 
and you understand things quickly and accurately. You're smart. You're sharp. You have the mind of Christ. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Don't let your kids or yourself walk around saying and thinking that you can't do something. That's unbiblical. That's not biblical. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Amen. Okay. Let's see where we're at here. Um, 1 Timothy, let's go to 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. Paul writes to Timothy, he says, Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our, for our enjoyment. So the secret remains the same even when I'm not shipwrecked, being beaten, being talked about, if I'm adrift at sea, if I'm behind on my payments or struggling in my marriage or battling addiction, the secret remains the same. It's the same. I can do all things through Christ because my trust is in him. It's in him who richly gives me all I need for my enjoyment. I love this, I love this scripture. You know that God knows what you need for your, your enjoyment? God knows what you need to enjoy yourself. He knows that. And here's the cool part. He richly gives it to us if we trust in him. This is, this is good right here. God knows what you need for your enjoyment, and he richly gives it to you if your trust is in him. So why do I find myself chasing after the things I enjoy when God said he would add it to me? Why am I chasing after my enjoyment when God said that he would richly give us all I need for it. Pastor Nate said this recently. He said, I won't be fulfilled chasing what God has designed to be added. You'll never be fulfilled chasing something that you're after that God has designed to add to your life. This apparently includes all the things for your enjoyment. This is good news. 1 Timothy chapter 6, let's go up a few verses uh, to verse 6. He says, yet true godliness, and this Greek word godliness here is uh, Eusebia, Eusebia, and it means reverence for God and what he calls holy. So he says, true reverence for God and what he calls holy with contentment is itself great wealth. So when we're honoring and reverencing God, we call holy what he calls holy, and we're content with what he's done for us. This is called great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world, and we, can take, we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. It says, but people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. And I want to go back up and talk about this for, for just one minute, that true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. And I mentioned this earlier, but contentment isn't settling. Contentment is not settling. In fact, I, I, wrote, it, I wrote it down this way, and this is, this is how I understand it, just reading the word and putting the context of the word, putting it all together. Contentment is an outworking of living by faith. Contentment is my disposition when I'm living by faith. Okay? If I'm living by faith, then I will be content where, with where I'm at. All right, stay with me here. I'm good where I am because I know where I'm going. I'm good in this moment because I believe God's word over what I see. I'm good right now when it looks like things are bad because I'm not focused on what it looks like. I see something different that can't be seen with the natural eye. I'm not intimidated by my current circumstance because I know something. Okay, I know something. So contentment is really the outworking of what living by faith looks like. This is my disposition. Man, it looks like things are really uh, not going great for you. But, but you seem to be content. Well, I'm living by faith. I'm not looking to the things that you're seeing right now. That's not where my focus is. That's not where my focus is. 
I want to turn to Philippians chapter 1, verse 28. Like I said, I was reading Philippians, and this caught my eye. I'm not going to be intimidated by my current circumstance because I know something. Paul's saying, don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed, but that you are going to be saved even by God himself. And this came out in a message that we were listening to, uh, Keith Moore, uh, here recently. And he was talking about how, you know, in Psalms, it says, the, the Psalms 23, the Lord sets a table before us in the presence of our enemies. And here we are sitting at this table that the Lord has prepared for us, and it's in the presence of our enemies, and we're sometimes just focused over here on our enemies. We're looking at all of our enemies all around us because that's where he set the table at. But if we looked at what's on the table, look at what's on the table. Change, change what you're looking at. Why can you look this? Why can you look like that in the presence of your enemies and all that's going on? Well, I'm not looking at that. I've turned and I'm looking at something else here. He said, why am I looking at the enemy when there's a bountiful banquet of redemption dishes right in front of me? A bountiful banquet of redemption dishes. All that you need, all that you'll ever need is here right in front of you. And we got our next turn looking to like, oh my gosh, what's happening over here? What's happening back here? What's going on in my life? Turn around and look right in front of you. He has set you at a table in the presence of your enemies. And on it is everything that you'll ever need for this life and the next life. What am I looking at? What am I beholding? Somebody say this. I live by faith and not by sight. And not by sight. Um, Ecclesiastes 1.8, it says, Everything is wearisome beyond description. This is King Solomon in Ecclesiastes that we were talking about. He said Everything's, everything is weary beyond description. <laughs> no matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. This is why we look at the things we cannot see. We have got to become skilled at looking at, and it sounds, it sounds, um, it's contradictory. How do I look at something I can't see? I'm looking at, this right here is more than just words on a paper. This, this is Jesus. This is life. This is something that's alive. Something that's alive, something that's alive is something that you can see. You just, you got to look with different eyes. We have got to become skilled at looking and focusing on the things that we don't see. So I want to go back up and read this part in 1 Timothy 6 again. Uh, 1 Timothy 6, let's pick up in verse 9 and read this again. It says, But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierce themselves with many sorrows. So what are the key words here? Because we've heard this, and I want to point out two key words in this scripture. Can you go back to verse 9 for me real quick? It says, but people who long to be rich. Okay? Long to be rich. And then in verse 10 here, two words here, long and love. Money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. Okay? So long and love are the two words here. People who want it and people who love it. People who want more of it, want more money, 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 and the people who love it. You know that there's a lot of billionaires out there that could care less about money? And there's a lot of people living in abject poverty that that's all they ever think about is money. Just because, just because you have something doesn't mean that you love it. Just because you have something doesn't mean you love it. We're, we're, we're thinking wrong if, if we're thinking that everybody who is rich loves money and that's how they have it. Untrue. That is not true. Just because you have a lot of something does not mean you love it. And if that were true, there would be a lot of people who are living in poverty across the world who don't care about money, don't think about it, and yet that's all they do. They're, all they're thinking about is how they can get out of the situation that they're in. And they're obsessed with getting more of it. They're longing for it. I like what it says in the Passion Translation in verse 10. It says, loving money is a root of all evils. Some people run after it so much that they have given up their faith. Guys, this is a big deal. This is a big deal. Some people have gone after it so much that they have given up their faith. Craving more of it pushes them away from the faith 
into error, compounding misery in their lives. This is a serious thing. And you see it happening to people. You see it happening to people where they're just after a little bit more. We, we've, had the, we've recognized this in our own lives at times. When that's become more of a focus and more of a thing, and I gotta have more, and I got, what am I doing? I'm longing for more money. I'm longing for it. And I'm getting on a road that leads to a dangerous place if I don't take God's word as correction and turn myself around. Because what it says is it pushes them away from the faith into error. And it compounds misery in their lives. That's not a place that we want to be. Hebrews 13.5 says something similar. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, say this with me, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? This is where we're at. Get, you, know, you know why that we can be content with what we have? Because God said this, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Wherever you're at, I'm there. If I can't be content knowing that God is with me, I will never be content. Period. Adding anything else into my life would be meaningless. It would do nothing for me if I can't be content where God is at. I will not be content. This is, this is a key for us. So, I want to close with this. Um, coaches make practice plans for their players. They don't just go into practice and wing it. Some of them do. That's probably not being a good coach. Coaches who are trying to get something accomplished, they make practice plans. They work on points of emphasis. They work on things that they need to work on to get better, right? Um, a lot of times we'll come into church, we may take notes, we may not, we may hear something, we may just go out. We need to make a practice plan for our life. Do, hearing the word and doing nothing with it, the Bible calls that deceiving yourself. It's, you're living in deception. To hear something that you know you need to apply in your life and not do it, it's called deception if you don't do it. So we need to make, we need to make a practice plan. For our lives, when, when favorable, listen, when favorable and unfavorable, so, yeah, you know what? When unfavorable circumstances come up, we might, we might be a little more, you know what? I'm, I'm so thankful for what I have right now and what God's done for me. He's been so good to me with where I'm at right now. He is my source, and I, and I trust him. Hey, guess when you also need to do that? When favorable circumstances come up, you need to be doing the same thing. And let's not forget the Lord our God who brought us out of where he brought us out of and who did for us what he did for us. Man, we've seen what happened to the Israelites when they did this. That's not going to be us. So when we get that promotion, when we get that new vehicle, when, when we see that God is working and his promises are coming to, our, and coming to pass in our lives, I'm going to take the same approach as if something unfavorable happened. I want to look to the Lord. I'm going to trust in him. I'm going to thank him for what he's done for me. I'm going to think about how heaven is my home, and this is amazing, and it's awesome right now, but it's not the thing. It's not the thing. That's the thing. That's the thing. What he's done for me is that's the thing. That's the thing. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. Let's stand. So let's make that, let's make that plan. Write something down. Do what you need to do to implement that in your life to where... To where you don't let a moment go by whether something good or bad happens and you don't address it with what we learned about tonight. We can be content in any situation. We know the secret now. We know the secret. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for Jesus. Lord, that's our heart right now. We're we're so thankful for what you've done for us. You bankrupted heaven when you sent Jesus for us. You've given us everything. You've given us everything. And we're so thankful. So we know in this moment and in every moment, if we put our trust in you, we know that we'll never, ever, ever be let down. You promised us that you would never leave us, that you would never forsake us. 
so we know we can be content with where we're at at any point, just like the Apostle Paul was. He learned that, and Lord, we ask you, teach us that more and more. As our coach, remind us, hey, we're going to practice this and do this. We thank you that, that, that you've given us the Holy Spirit to help fulfill that role in our lives. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you to coach us this week and the next and show us more and more of your word. And we thank you that it's life to us and it's healing to all of our flesh, your word. We love you and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You thankful for God's word? It is life. It's life to you. Pastor, anything? Okay. We love you guys. Uh, we will see you on Sunday morning for part two. You going to be here? Yeah. All right. We will see you here. Have a good night.